we were discussing this uh, dominant pole compensation of an op amp, dominant pole frequency compensation using the Miller multiplication capacitor across the second stage. Okay. The idea is that we have two stages and remember both are configured as inverting meaning these current sources point downwards that is why we are able to connect the capacitor across the second stage and get an effective capacitor at the output of the first stage which is much larger than the actual capacitance value. Now, it turns out that it has a bigger value than merely magnifying uh, the capacitance, but it needs some working out which is what we were doing. Okay. Then a buffer and we have this C C. Okay. So, you have capacitors I mean there are essentially two nodes here this can be treated as a current source equivalently the input voltage is converted to current using an ideal voltage control current source and you can write the nodal analysis equations for it which is an efficient way of uh, solving for circuits. As I said even circuit simulators which solve for circuits with thousands or millions of nodes use nodal analysis. Okay. What, I mean uh, you learned both nodal and mesh analysis in electric circuits right. So, any idea which one you would use which one would be preferred uh, both solve the same thing obviously. Why? So, no, no that is not for this circuit I meant uh, for any circuit. No. Dividing? No, no. The equation finally that you get will be some matrix times variable vector equals the source vector. Always, it has to be like that. The source vector in the simplest case for nodal analysis consists of current sources, for mesh analysis, voltage sources. But that's actually a very artificial constraint. You can't say that hey, make only circuits with current sources, right? In this case, it happened to be so, and for hand analysis. So let's forget hand analysis. Let's say you had a more complicated circuit. Just to set up the equations, which one is easier? Huh? Why? Usually we require. It's a very very trivial thing actually. When calculating reciprocals, I don't think that's a. <laughs> Huh? That is one may, uh, thing maybe you could look at which has fewer equations and then try to do that, but uh, which is easier to start writing. Yeah, I think it is lot easier to identify which the nodes are than the loops right? because uh, how do you identify independent loops you can have many loops and then you have to make sure that the nodes the, the loops that you identify are independent. So, how would you go about doing that you have to actually start from a tree that is some uh, uh, set of branches which links all n nodes, but without forming a loop and then you add one branch at a time each one will form an independent loop and that is how you have to do that. Okay. So, nodal analysis is a little bit easier also when uh, uh, writing down equations of course, if you had a computer you could set it to do either of them quite easily. Okay. So, anyway if you do write the nodal analysis equations we get G O 1 plus S C 1 plus C C minus S C C and then here this is the admittance matrix times the variable vector this is V O this is also V O because it is a buffer and the whole thing equals the current source vector which is that and you can of course, simply if this is the matrix G you have to invert it and pre multiply this vector by the inverse to get the solution. Uh, you can find the inverse I think for a 2 by 2 matrix it is quite easy. How do you do that? 
Yeah, you swap the diagonals and uh, the off diagonals you invert the signs that is all and then of course, you are divided by the determinant of the matrix. But anyway, in this case especially when you are interested only in one of the variables, uh, the other way of doing it using Kramer's rule is also quite easy. Uh, so, you substitute whichever uh, you look at the index of the element in the vector that you want. So, in this case we want the second one as the output. So, you substitute the second column of the left hand side matrix with the right hand side vector and take the ratio of determinants ok and that is what we did and the result that we got was So, that is the denominator so so far uh, this is exact this is the transfer function of the circuit and as you expect first of all uh, just looking at the circuit what is the order you would have expected order of the transfer function to y huh? No, no, that is the that is what we get after doing the algebra, just looking at the circuit. Huh? Yeah, there is a loop. So, what is so what is the number of what is the order of the system? I mean, can you tell by looking at the circuit? Number of yeah, it is basically the number of independent uh, state variables, and what are number of independent state variables? One way to look at it is the number of independent initial conditions you can assign. Okay. So, you can have capacitors and inductors. Of course, the order is bounded by the sum of the number of capacitors and inductors. If you have 5 capacitors and 5 inductors, it will be at most 10th order, it can be less. Okay. So, you can have capacitor loops or you can have uh, uh, inductor uh, in a uh, connected to a node in such a way that the currents are not independent of each other. Okay. So, now here I can assign an initial condition to this and that, but not this. Okay. I can assign an initial conditions to any two, but not the third one. So, that is basically the order. Okay. So, the number of capacitors tells you the upper bar limit on the order, but uh, the number of independent state variables that you can assign tells you the order. Okay. So, it is a second order uh, system and then it also has a 0 and then this by the way is in the right half plane, right. The 0 is at plus g m 2 by c c. Okay. So, you have a right half plane 0 and why does that come about? Essentially from the output of the first stage to the output of the second stage, there are two paths one through the g m 2 the other one through the capacitor and this is another characteristic. Typically, when you have two sort of parallel paths or two coupling paths to the output and the two have different phase shifts, I mean different frequency dependences you will end up getting zeros. This is not the only way to get zeros. You can have other ways also, but uh, I mean, if you again with your experience with first order circuits, you know that this one has only a pole. But if I do that, there are also two paths to the output, right, through the capacitor and through the resistor, and this gives you a zero. So when you see something like this, when you see multiple paths to the output, which kind of add up, and the paths have different frequency dependence. Obviously, if you have a resistor in parallel with the resistor, you are not going to get a 0. Okay. So, you will uh, you could end up getting a 0. Okay. So, that is what we get and the answers also look the expression also looks reasonable under the basic sanity checks the DC gain is correct and then also with C C equal to 0, you get two independent first order systems. Right? You can factorize it into two first order systems and the first order systems without C C you can identify the poles
by inspection ok if without CC these two elements form a pole and the, those two elements form another pole ok. So, that is a uh, that is the expression itself. Now, of course, getting the expression is one thing and that is the easy part it is just analysis and algebra, but uh, uh, interpreting the expression is more important because finally, you have to use this for design. What is the objective here to find the value of C C so that the system is stable to sufficient margin ok. So, for that the denominator is too complicated to actually find the roots of the quadratic right we cannot do the minus b plus minus square root of b square minus 4 ac and all that stuff. You can write it of course, but the result is completely useless. So, we have to make a number of approximations and the approximations that we will make of course, uh, many times it looks like making approximations is the easy way out, but it is not because uh, the exact answer of course, you can get maybe it is difficult, but maybe with computers or something you can get them. But approximations depend on context, so you have to be aware of uh, what you are looking for before you make the approximations. So, in a way it is actually little more difficult to find uh, to figure out which approximations to use when, but of course, approximations make the uh, calculations easier that is why we use them and more importantly uh, they give us insight ok. Because this I mean today you take any basic uh, mathematical tool like MATLAB it will you give it a high order polynomial it will give you the roots. So, that is not a difficult thing ok numerically and even symbolically there are tools which will do that, but uh, we want some useful expressions useful in the sense we should give us insight and should tell us which way to vary the component. So, that we get a good design ok. So, for that we use this approximation. We assume that the two roots are such that for x 1 these two are dominant and for x 2 those two are dominant. That is we can neglect one of the terms of the quadratic equation and uh, essentially it reduces to a linear uh, equation right. So, we will get x 1 to be approximately minus c by b and x 2 to be approximately minus b by a ok. Now, what does this approximation mean? It means that the magnitude of x 1 is much less than the magnitude of x 2 and at least this looks like a reasonable thing because at least uh, in the end this is what we are looking for ok. So, finally, when we design the value of uh, C C choose the value of C C effectively this is what we want right. We want the poles of the system to be far apart. So, when our system is designed properly at least this approximation is expected to hold well ok. So, that way it is not a bad approximation. Of course, this does not work at all if uh, this had complex conjugate roots because then clearly this cannot be the case the magnitudes are equal to each other right. So, it works only when the poles are real and well separated. So, that is the that is what we uh, calculate. So, if I take this uh, denominator and write it as s plus p 1 times s plus p 2 remember minus p 1 and minus p 2 are the poles of the system. So, p 1 is approximately this divided by that one ok. p 1 is the lower frequency pole right p 1 comes from neglecting a x square ok. So, we will get g o 1 g o 2 divided by C C G M 2 plus G O 2 plus G O 1 plus C 1 G O 2 plus C 2 G O 1 ok. So, this itself is an approximate expression and the second pole is So, this again uh, these are approximate expressions and to interpret them we need to maybe make further approximations and so on, but the first question is without C C what were P 1 and P 2? G O 1 by C 1, G O 2 by C 2 
okay so the first thing to look for our idea what was the idea of putting cc why did we put cc there to move the poles further apart so that's what we have to look for first okay so now what has happened here going from here to there has p1 gone to a higher frequency or a lower frequency lower how do you know yeah so the easiest way to see this is i will move g2 go2 to the denominator and so this whole thing will become gm2 by go2 plus 1 plus go1 by go2 and this one goes away and here we have go1 by go2 okay so earlier without cc there was a pole associated with this node these components right there was c1 there was a conductance go1 and there was a capacitance c1 across it and the pole that resulted from that was go1 by c1 okay it was very easy to see you could associate the conductance go1 with the capacitance c1 across it so that gives you a pole go1 by c1 now please stare at this expression and let me know if such a physical interpretation is possible even in approximate sense remember we started from miller effect right what do you see so we i mean i still uh, rearranged it in the form of go1 but divided by something and that something in the denominator obviously has dimensions of capacitance but is there some interpretation for that thing that you see can you make sense of it even approximately as the conductance divided by some capacitance you see in the circuit no no that's okay but now we want it with cc being non zero right because we want to look at first of all which way it has moved right and then uh, so what i am looking for is some explanation of the sort of way i see this conductance and i see this capacitance across it do you see something of the sort or no and how did we get this circuit from miller effect right so i think there you have all the hints you need what's that cc into 1 plus yeah so if we didn't do any analysis but just went with our uh, miller effect stuff with the second stage gain being minus gm2 by go2 okay and you connect cc across it this is equivalent to what cc times 1 plus gm2 by go2 so let's say this was indeed the case so it was exactly equivalent to that where would the pole be where would the pole be go1 divided by the sum of these capacitors okay and that's exactly what you see right you see go1 sorry that's not exactly what you see that's approximately what you see go1 divided by c1 plus miller multiplied cc okay you understand so it's actually not uh, although the analysis results look complicated the miller effect intuition was correct now we do have these extra terms and that's because i mean these things come about there are two things that has happened first of all firstly the second stage amplifier is not a voltage controlled voltage source if it was you would have got exactly cc plus cc times 1 plus gm2 by go1 cc times 1 plus a plus c1 it's not and secondly this expression for p1 itself is an approximate root to the quadratic equation okay so there are those extra terms you do expect them because you don't expect that this is exactly the same as the miller case that we evaluated but you do see that these are the dominant terms right first of all let's assume 
for a moment that C C comes out to be in the same order as C 1 and C 2, this may or may not be true again we have to check, but uh, in that case which is the most dominant term in the denominator C C times G M 2 by G O 2, okay. so it is very closely equal to the conductance at the output of the first stage divided by the Miller multiplied C C. Okay. So, predominantly now earlier the pole was determined by C 1, now it is determined by that okay. and in fact to a sort of first crude approximation we can take the first pole to be exactly equal to that. Okay. So, there are various approximations we make at each stage as long as you, you should understand the reasoning behind the approximations then you can make all kinds of approximations. The exact answers can be evaluated using a using an algebraic tool. Okay. and these two are at least I do not have any physical intuition for it, but I will blame it on the approximations we have made and more importantly the second stage not a voltage controlled voltage source. Okay. But you also you should be able to see that if uh, the conductances are of similar magnitude and the capacitances are of uh, similar magnitude, those extra terms are not the dominant ones. The dominant one is C C times G M 2 by G O 2. Is this okay? So, the first pole has indeed moved to a much lower frequency and if you had to do this by simply connecting a capacitor across uh, C 1. Right, that was our original method. We simply put the capacitor across C1. You would have to use a much larger capacitance than CC. So that itself is an advantage of this method. With a smaller capacitor, you get the same result, nearly the same result. Is this okay? Any questions? So again, all these things. If you have any questions at any time, please ask because there is no point rushing through it if you don't understand the whole thing. So it has lowered the first pole as we expected. What has happened to the second one P 2? Again you may call the reasonable approximations, we are making an op amp. So, G M 2 will be much more than G O 2, G M 1 will be much more than G O 1 and so on. It has increased, why? How do you tell? Uh, with Okay, I mean just crudely tell me why do you think it has increased like obviously how do you tell you have a fraction you can look at what is happening to the numerator what is happening to the, de to the denominator and tell right or at least try to tell I mean sometimes both may increase both may decrease the net result may be harder to figure out, but in this case what is it that has newly appeared in the numerator. Huh? Which is the dominant term in the numerator now? C C times G M 2. So, G M 2 has first before G M 2 had no role in this pole right, it had it was only the output conductance G O 2. So, now G M 2 appears in the numerator of course, with some multiplier, but uh, still G M 2 is expected to be many tens of times larger than G O 2. So, you do expect that the pole has increased in frequency, it also depends on the value of C C. 
obviously if CC was 0 then GM2 again it reduces to the original case, but we will assume that we have chosen CC to move the poles far from each other. Okay. equal to yeah yeah but i mean that has no uh, significance because this is an approximate route to the quadratic equation right with cc equal to 0 you can solve for the quadratic exactly and you will get these roots okay with the approximation also maybe what you are saying is it's not widely off but uh, we are looking for a case where the poles are very far apart so in that case uh, and I mean we want to introduce CC so that that happens. So, we have to do a little more interpretation or analysis. So, what I will do is I will divide this by CC plus C 1. Now, this looks completely arbitrary, but uh, the reason I am doing it is here in the numerator I had G O 2. Okay. Here in the numerator I have G O 2 times C 1 plus G O 2 times C C. Okay. So, if I divide both numerator and denominator by C 1 plus C C, I will have G O 2 as before right and then we can look at the rest of the terms and decide. So, in general anything if you stare at it long enough has a very simple explanation that is the bottom line. Okay. So, that is why it takes time to learn things. It is not that it takes a lot of time to derive anything, it just takes time to think about everything, so that you understand it very well. Okay. So, if I divide both numerator and denominator by uh, C 1 plus C C, what do I get? I will put G M 2 first, I expect that I expect that to be the biggest. So, all I did was I mean there is no further approximation going from the first to the second expression here. All I have done is to divide the numerator and denominator by something okay. and originally we had G O 2 by C 2. So, now you can see that this is perhaps it is little easier to compare these two than these two. Okay. So, what do you see? In the numerator, you have an additional conductance term, right? You have originally had G O 2, now you have G O 2 plus some fraction of G M 2. And that fraction we do not yet know what it is, but again, if C C, C 1 and C 2 come out to be of similar magnitudes, then this is a good fraction of G M 2. So, that is likely to be the dominant term actually. So, it is not, whereas originally G O 2, the output conductance of the second stage predominantly determined the second pole. Now, it is G M 2 that determines that. We can again find physical intuition behind this, Okay, nothing is arbitrary here, because finally, when you have this real poles, you should be able to interpret everything as some conductance, some capacitance across it. It is always like that. Okay, You may have to struggle a little bit, you may have to stare at the circuit a little bit to find out where the conductance is and so on, but you can do that. Okay. So, the numerator has increased, the denominator also has increased, it was only C 2, now it is C 2 and what is this? C 1 series combination of C 1 and C C. Okay. So, again we have to see whether this is some coincidence of algebra or there is actually such a thing in the circuit. Okay. G M 2, the absolute values of G M 2 and G O 2 you cannot tell, but G M 2 will be much more than G O 2, because we are making an amplifier with a high gain. Huh? No, no, there is no See, this is a dimension quantity, you cannot say some dimension quantity is very high, you can only say it is very high in comparison to something else. So, G M 2 will be much higher than G O 2, that is all we can tell. Okay. Now, for some cases G M 2 may be milli Siemens or even a Siemens or something and in some other case maybe it is micro Siemens, okay. whether it is large or small depends on the context, but G M 2 will be much more than G O 2, that is what you want in an op amp. right? 
we want an amplifier with a high gain ok. So, now uh, we have got some result and I think we are pretty sure that P 2 has moved to a higher frequency right. In the expression for P 2 we had G O 2 by C 2 and the new expression we have G O 2 plus something and C 2 plus something in the denominator. But I think you do kind of uh, realize that because G M 2 is much more than G O 2 the numerator has increased a lot more than the denominator ok. So, although both have increased you expect this pole frequency to increase is that ok. So, now the next thing is so actually yeah that by itself is a good thing right because whereas we before by connecting a capacitor across C 1 we were keeping the second pole fixed and moving in the first pole. Now, that is not what we have done. So, it is going this way which is actually better for us because we want them to be far apart what is the advantage here by moving P 2 to a higher frequency we have to set the unity loop gain frequency to be let us say one fourth of the new value of P 2 which is increased. So, the bandwidth you get from this method will be higher ok. The calculation may be a little more involved, but the uh, advantage for the system is much higher ok. So, this business of uh, connecting C C a capacitor across the second stage to move the poles apart from each other and this does exactly what you want it moves the higher one higher and the lower one lower. This is known as pole splitting. So, sometimes this is also called as pole splitting compensation. So, that also we have uh, convinced ourselves with uh, using the calculations that the pole split that is one pole moves to a higher frequency and the other pole moves to a lower frequency. Now, exactly how to choose C C we will see, but you get the idea. So, as the second P 2 moves to a higher frequency you have to make the unity gain frequency unity loop gain frequency one fourth of the non dominant pole ok. So, there are other things to be included we will look at that. So, before we go there is there any physical interpretation for each of these terms this one, this one, this one, this one maybe this one also. What I mean is I mean earlier we did do that right. So, G O 1 was the conductance at the output of the first stage this was the Miller multiplied capacitor and this is simply the capacitor that is there at the first stage. So, of course, this this one and this one we did not have any particular physical interpretation, but that is ok at least most of the stuff we are able to account for. Let us go with the denominator, denominator is C 2 plus C 1 times C C divided by C 1 plus C C. So, what is that I mean do you actually have a structure like that I mean or can you first of all come up with an arrangement of uh, components which will give you that capacitance. C 1 series with C C and parallel with C 2. So, do we have such a thing in the circuit? Yeah. So, if you So, we were let us say originally also looking at looking between these two terminals ok. Now, if you blew apart every component other than the capacitor. So, that is exactly what you see between those two terminals right you have C 2 between these two terminals and C 1 and C C. So, there is some interpretation that this is the capacitance between these two terminals ok. Of course, we do have other components as well that is why we get some extra terms, but there is some perfectly reasonable interpretation for this. Ok. 
okay so the denominator is now fine what about the numerator first of all which is the easiest term to interpret in the numerator which one g o 2 g o 2 is there between the output terminal and ground but it is there that is correct but the more significant term seems to be this okay somehow effectively we have got a conductance which is a fraction of g m 2 so is there any interpretation for that one what is g m 2 in our circuit where do we get g m 2 huh? what component is giving us uh, g m 2 voltage control current source now we have got a conductance so if i give you a voltage control current source forget this particular fraction and so on if i give you a voltage control current source can you make a conductance out of it yes no okay. how, how would you do it voltage source series with no 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 what i want is i give you let's say a four terminal device right and i want a two terminal device a prime which behaves like a resistor so somehow turn this into that one yeah so this is in fact the upper one is a more universal element right in that both of them give you a current that is proportional to voltage a resistor gives you a current that is proportional to the applied voltage and so does voltage control current source but in the voltage control current source the current is flowing elsewhere okay whereas in a uh, resistor if i apply a voltage here v test v test by r flows here it's very easy to arrange right so i apply v test okay and actually gm times v test flows here but if i want it to be drawn from the voltage source i can do that is this okay yes or no so now if i put this whole thing inside a black box and expose only these two terminals what will it look like from the point of those two terminals it's a resistance of value 1 by gm okay so if you take a voltage control current source and place it in feedback you will get a resistor okay and the principle seems very easy also right a resistor gives you a current proportional to a voltage at the same two terminals a resistor is a two terminal element here you have four terminals going from four to two is easy just connect them together that's all okay and of course exactly the same thing can be done with a current controlled voltage source okay is this fine and in fact this is used quite often also because you have the control sources are universal i mean control sources are very nice actually with control sources you can synthesize all kinds of elements okay so that's why there is so much effort to make control sources there are very few of them available like the transistors which has been developed and improved and perfected and so on but uh, control sources are key to controlling anything okay so you have an independent controlling terminal and a control terminal and the control the gain must be high it can be eventually nonlinear, but any if you want to invent a new device to replace the transistor essentially what you will be doing is inventing a new control source with a high proportionality constant from the control port to the controlled port ok. So, anyway all we now we know that hey from a voltage controlled current source we can get a resistor or a conductance. Now, please explain this particular conductance that we have got so here we have a conductance of gm2 times cc by c1 plus cc whereas the control source has a proportionality constant of gm2 okay so how do you get that Uh, uh. Yeah. 
So, first of all, so here if I do this right, if I make this connection, if I make V x equals let me uh, let me call this V 2, if I make V x equals V 2, this implies that the resistance is 1 by g m. Okay. Now, let us say I wanted uh, a resistance not of 1 by g m, but 1 by alpha times g m. What should I do? Forget how to implement the circuit. What is it that I need to do? By making V x equals V 2, I got R equals 1 by g m. So, by what should I do here? Huh? Basically, I need to make V x equals alpha times V 2, right. So, then what happens is, okay, then the measurement is not here. So, this is equal to alpha times V 2, right. With some feedback arrangement, I need to do that. Then, if I apply V test here, the current that flows here is alpha times G m times V test. Is that okay? So, sorry, if you have a voltage controlled current source of uh, proportionality constant G m and if you feed back the entire voltage to the input, you will get 1 by G m. If you get a, if you feed back fraction of the voltage, then you will get that fraction times G m as the conductance. So, you can get higher or lower conductances. Okay. Is this fine? By So, now you have one more degree of freedom you have gm value and then you also have the fraction that is actually fed back okay so based on this what do you see in the circuit yeah. no no i didn't show the implementation so one possible implementation is in fact here okay so, one way could be I mean I use a resistive divider for instance. Okay. Now, of course, this current will include the current in the G m and current in the resistive divider. So, that also contributes to the resistance, okay. but the contribution of G m will be a fraction of what it was before. Is this okay? So, essentially if you have a controlled uh, uh, source by using feedback that is the controlling quantity should have a fraction of the voltage from the other side, then you can get a resistance of some value. I mean with the resistive divider you cannot do that, but if somehow using an amplifier you make alpha greater than 1, you can actually get a smaller resistance. Okay. That that is in fact used that is how you get a low output resistance in feedback amplifiers. If you remember one of the earlier tutorials. I think essentially you were asked if you have an op amp of gain A naught let us say and that itself is ideal, but it has some output resistance. Now, if you apply feedback around it, what is the output resistance? Do you remember or you can should be able to calculate quite easily now? What is it? In fact, it is related to something that we calculated very recently. What is it? If you apply V test, what is the current that flows? And we calculated this actually just two classes ago. Huh? A plus. That is not a resistance. What I want is the output resistance. How is the. What is A0 by A plus 1? The output resistance here is R naught. What is the output resistance there? That has to have dimensions of resistance, guys. I mean, it cannot be dimensionless. What is the answer? So, does this expression remind you of something? Yeah. So, this one, if you redraw it, you are looking from here, right? You have R naught across a across an inverting amplifier of gain A naught. So, 
this is R naught by A plus 1. So, essentially you can get a smaller resistance also if you have an amplifier and here I showed a resistor instead of that you could also have a voltage controlled uh, current source. You can do this calculation yourselves. So, let us say this is V x and this is G m times V x then you can calculate sorry G m times V x then you can calculate what the resistance is and see ok. So, you can get higher or lower resistance, but anyway let us get back to the point we were discussing. Why do we get G m 2 times C c by C 1 plus C c? By looking at the circuit can you tell? Between which two terminals should I look now? In fact, we have already explained the other terms by looking at some particular output terminals where between between the output node and ground ok. So, now again let to avoid distraction let me remove all the other components. If we had only this part ok, then I applied V test here. What is the voltage that appears there? What is the voltage that appears here between these two? V test times C C by C 1 plus C C ok and that times G M 2 is the current that flows ok. So, the total current also includes the capacitive current, but the conductive part the part through G m basically is G m 2 times C c by C 1 plus C c ok. So, this C c it is connected between the output and input of the second stage. So, it actually introduces some local feedback around the second stage. So, because of that it contributes a conductance of G m 2 times C c by C 1 plus C c ok. So, now we have an explanation for a very very reasonable explanation for this term also ok. So, this is fine, this is fine, the denominator is fine, only this part is extra. Again, I will blame it on the approximations we have made. There are approximations to find the poles and also the circuit is not exactly what I showed right. It does not have only G m 2 and the two capacitors, it has these other resistors as well. So, it will have some contribution from G o 1 ok. But you can see that is going to be negligible compared to the contribution from G m 2 ok. This is fine. So, in summary the placing a capacitance C c across the second stage moves the poles further from each other right and in fact one of the poles moves higher the other one moves lower compared to when you had no C c. In fact, this is the ideal thing for frequency compensation or stabilizing the op amp ok. So, it is very good, it is a very good scheme, but you also need to be able to evaluate the value of C c which will uh, give you the correct phase margin. For that we need to know the value of uh, P 1, P 2 or more importantly the unity loop gain frequency and P 2 right. So, that uh, we have to resort to some approximations, but it is ok, it is a reasonable approximation. It holds in fact, in the conditions that we want when the poles are far from each other and we also have an approximate value and not only that some physical interpretation for the expressions for expressions that we get for P 1 and P 2 ok. So, now we have to put everything together calculate the phase margin and make sure that uh, it is sufficient and the way to do it is of course, by setting the unity loop gain frequency to be sufficiently smaller than the non dominant pole and 0 ok. Any questions? Uh, please go through this there is a lot of calculation. I would not say it is difficult calculation for I mean usually the kind of uh, algebra that is uh, that you see in analog circuits is quite elementary ok. It is really trivial compared to many other areas of electrical engineering, but the important thing is of course, to do the analysis correctly and more importantly to uh, interpret the results. Finally, the objective is design right you have to you are given a new situation and you have to find the answers numerically for that situation ok. So, in engineering understanding means being able to calculate for a new situation.
right? Otherwise, there is no understanding. I mean, you don't know the circuit if you are able to draw the circuit. You know the circuit only if you are able to make useful calculations about the circuit. Okay. 